Hey friends, welcome to Riverheads Vineyard. I'm Justin, I'm one of the pastors here. I'm really glad to see you and welcome to you for joining us from home. Uh, I'm going to invite us to stand as we're able in the room here and we're going to start by uh, singing to the Lord together. It makes a big difference, I think, um, uh, whether we are inviting God as God invites us, right? So let's just take a moment. Uh, to do that. God is here. God is present. Jesus says that he is present as people gather in his name. And so I'm going to ask that there be a welcome in each of our hearts and also um, uh, that we just have the grace to receive everything that God has for us. God has something for you this morning. So, uh, Jesus, we thank you for what you've done for us. Father, we thank you for your heart of love. And Spirit, we say, Holy, Holy Spirit, come. Thank you that you invite us here, that it's you that makes us family together. And we want to have the grace to say yes again to you this morning, to give our hearts to you, to give you something of worth. You're worthy of all glory and honor and praise, God. Thank you that you go first and you love us first. i 
Lord God, thank you for that. And friends, every week we have the opportunity to have communion together as a church family. And you will notice that there are, uh, there are tables here on the front of the stage. There's also a table in the back to the left of the door. They have the elements on them. It's a cup. It's got a film on the top. And then there is a wafer and then another film and the juice. And those elements signify Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for you and me. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you. And feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. All honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. And you're welcome to the Lord's table anytime in the next two songs. We're going to do a, a song that's actually new uh, this, this week. Uh, it was written about a week ago in Denver. And uh, two of the vineyard churches in Denver are doing it this morning as well. And so uh, this is basically a song about gratitude and thanks, just like we ended our prayer uh, about communion. So this is a place to just have gratitude in whatever we're going through. So let's bring our real souls to the Lord in song. In the midst of 
the darkness when I close my eyes. You will be right by my side. You work while I'm resting and never grow tired. You provide, yeah, you do, all my days. And all my days, no matter what comes my way, all my days, I'm going to say thank you. For coming with love and never leaving, gonna say thank you for giving so much. Jesus, we thank you for coming with love and never leaving. Gonna say thank you for giving so much. Let us receive it, Lord. Let us receive you, Lord.
Yes, we love you. We love, we love. Oh, we love, we love. We love you. Yes, we love you. Yes, we do, Lord. We thank you for your presence here. It's so good to worship together, friends. Uh, you can be seated for now, and it's time for announcements, and Pete has those. Morning, Pete. Good morning, Justin. Happy Sunday, everybody. My name is Pete. I'm one of the pastors here. We are super glad that you are here as well. If you're visiting with us today, we're especially glad that you came. We have a welcome box for those of you who are visiting. It's available at the Welcome Center, which is just outside those doors. It has chocolate in it. Please stop by. Courtney's preaching today. She would love to meet you after the service. I want to say welcome, too, to our online viewers, those of you who are coming to us from your homes. I just found out, like last week, we had 40-some families joining us, and we miss you, and we love you, and you're a part of our family, too. So hopefully God brings us back together soon. All right, we have a purpose as a community here. God's called us to exist to help people love God, love people, and change the world. That's everything we're about at River Heights Vineyard. On Sundays, we have the chance to give toward that. You can give electronically using the instructions behind me or put gifts in the boxes in the back. And I would like to pray into our giving. Uh, God, we're so grateful for your incredible generosity, for the gift of your presence today, your son, the gift of the family that the church is to us. Thank you. And we're grateful for everything we have, God. You've been very generous to us. As we give back, we ask that you would put your hand on what we offer, that you would turn money into people loving you and loving each other here and in our community and around the world. We ask in the name of Christ. Amen. Could you please take the connection card out of your program? You got one of these in the paper you were handed at the door on the way in today. We ask, would you please fill one of these out every week that you are here? If you're with us regularly, you can just stick your name on the front. And if you're visiting with us, give us as much information as you're comfortable. There's stuff going on you can interact with on your card. And on the back is a spot for prayer requests. Our staff prays for all the requests that we receive. We want you to know there's people in my church praying for me. And so here's what we ask. Let us know how to pray. So I've got three requests as usual on my card, usually something for me, something for my kids, and something in general. So uh, just let us know how we can pray for you. At the end of the service, these go in the connection card boxes. Those are right behind you on the doors. Got three announcements for you. First, a year and a half ago, we formed a racial identity and inclusion team here at River Heights Vineyard. Our goal is just to grow in diversity. And it's three folks from minority culture and three folks from majority culture. We've been meeting for a year and a half. The goal is to build a relationship that can bear the burden of all the race issues that are going on in our lives and the world at the same time. 
And what we want to do is invite you to come join us for a week. We meet at my home uh, every other Wednesday at 6 o'clock, and we're opening our meeting for folks to come. We'll invite you in ones and twos. It'll take months to get through the people who've signed up already. We want to especially invite you if you're a member of non-white culture. Uh, we'd love to hear your story, but we're inviting everyone, and so we'll get to everyone. And so if you'd like to come, just let us know on your connection card, and you get to come to my house. I'll be super glad to welcome you there at the end of the service again. Put these in the boxes. Ash Wednesday is coming. The 40 days before Easter is known as Lent in church calendar and church history. And on Ash Wednesday, we commemorate the start of those 40 days with a service in which we receive an imposition of ashes. That's a cross on your forehead in ash. The service itself is going to include scripture and prayer, worship and reflection. That's on Wednesday, March 2nd at 7 p.m. Mark it on your calendars and come on down. Uh, if you would like to get to know us better as a community, we have uh, two classes where you get to know other folks who are new. You get to learn and ask anything you want to about the vineyard and about this church. And we also um, ask discussion questions so that 50% of what's going on is those of you who have come sharing answers with each other. And so you get to know someone. You get to recognize faces when you come on a Sunday. It's kind of great. And so Connect and Belong are our classes. We're offering Belong on Sunday, March 13th at 1 o'clock. We have child care. If you need it, let us know if you do. Again, you can let us know on the connection card. We would love to see you at Belong. All right, please take a moment and say hi to somebody nearby. Courtney is going to come deliver the message forthwith. Good morning. It's good to see all of you here this morning. Thanks for being with me. Thanks for joining us if you're joining online. Um, it's always just such a great privilege for me and such a humbling experience to be able to be up here and to share God's word with you all. Um, and so I'm thankful to be here today. And if you don't know, my name is Courtney Herwald, and I'm a part of the volunteer preaching team here at River Heights. And so I just want to ask us to join together in prayer before I start, just to invite the Holy Spirit to come. Um, I know that God wants to speak to our hearts, and he wants to speak specifically to you right where you're at this morning. So let's invite God to do that together. God, we just thank you that you are already here with us. God, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive from you this morning. God, we would be able to hear your voice both individually and as a community, um, and that we would be able to know that you have our best interests in mind, God. We just surrender this time and ourselves to you. Amen. So I've really been enjoying doing some of these lectionary readings that we have. And if you haven't had a chance to look at them, there's an insert in your bulletin that has um, daily uh, scripture passages that we can read throughout the week. And then usually we've been preaching on Sunday uh, on either the ones for Sunday or that have happened during the week. And it's been a really good way for me to get um, into the, the Bible again and maybe read passages that I wouldn't normally look at. Um, so I would encourage you to do that. Um, and I felt like this week um, they went really well with what Je Jeff was talking about last week. And he was talking about this idea of us having a heart issue, um, our need for Christ and for forgiveness of our sins. He talked about how we can choose to either live a cursed life of trusting in others rather than the Lord and moving our lives more away from the Lord, or we can choose a blessed life where we are rooted in, protected by, and productive for the Lord. I think most of us would say that we want to live the blessed life, right? I think most of us would also agree, though, that when challenging circumstances come our way, when life feels like everything is against us, even and maybe especially when we feel like we're doing all the right things, we can find ourselves easily choosing the life that goes away from the Lord rather than towards the Lord. How many of you have found yourselves doubting God's presence in your life during difficult times? I certainly have. <laughs> 
Maybe if you're like me, the circumstances of the last two years have, or more actually, have taken their toll on you and you find yourself maybe longing for the hope that Christ promises us. I know I've experienced many moments of despair and hopelessness myself where I seem to have more questions than answers, maybe more doubt than faith. And it's in times like these that our faith and our reliance on God is really put to the test. It can even feel like God is testing us by being absent. And so we can easily turn to other things that seem more tangible and more immediate relief from what we are experiencing. We can be tempted to give up in, when it seems that God is not blessing our lives in the ways that we want. And I think that, at least I know for me, we can be tempted to not only give up on God, but to give up on the things that God has put in our lives to strengthen us. Maybe it's the community of believers that we are a part of or that make up the church or our families or friends, especially when they fail to meet our expectations, when they disappoint us. We forget that we're all fallen in need of a savior. And yet the truth is that the Bible tells us that God never leaves us or forsakes us. And we are called to love one another regardless of our differences or circumstances. In fact, we're even called to love those we see as our enemies. When so much of our world seems to tell us a different story, how do we stand firm in this truth of God in the midst of our trials? How do we continue to love those who have disappointed us or who have even seemed to want the worst for us? How do we not let things like bitterness and anger and resentment take root in us? Because once those things take root, it becomes so much more difficult to discern what the blessed life looks like. And it can start to look like maybe taking our lives into our own hands. We might even come to believe that holding on to our own pain and unforgiveness or our own ideas of justice and righteousness is actually more fulfilling than a life surrendered to the Lord. We might wonder if a life surrendered to God is really worth it. Before we know it, we've forgotten that we are the beloved children of God, that we were created to love God and to love one another, that we no longer trust in the promises of God to give us life to the fullest, especially if it might look different than we might think. Does this resonate with anyone in here? I know I've had many moments of this. And yet... <laughs> I believe God has promised us that we, he will give us all that we need to live into our identity as God's beloved children. And I believe that God has shown God's self to be faithful over and over again to the promises that God will never leave us or forsake us. When we surrender our lives to God, we actually become more who we were created to be, children of light, of hope in a world that often looks dark, in a world that can often feel like darkness is winning, maybe even in our own lives. But thankfully, we have God's word to us. And the Bible shows us that we are not alone in experiencing these things. And thankfully, there are stories of people who have found themselves in some pretty dire circumstances and still remained faithful to God and were a light in dark places. They knew their true identity as God's beloved children and surrendered their lives to God's plans. None of them are perfect people by any means, and most of them have come from long lines of imperfect people. But these stories are meant to encourage and inspire us to trust that what God can do in us and through us is greater than whatever trials that we might face. So this morning, I want to look at one particular character from the Bible found in Genesis 37 through 50, and that's the story of Joseph. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this story or at least have heard it at some point, bits of it on your radar, um, but if it's been a while since you've read it, maybe you remember seeing the popular musical Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. This is quite a creative rendition of the story played out by high school theater groups everywhere. I remember in my high school, every girl had a crush on the guy who played Joseph because you had to be of a certain caliber, you know, to get that role. Um, and I do think that the musical takes a lot of liberties, but it gets a lot of things right too. 
So, of course, I could not pass by the opportunity to share just a little clip that begins the story for us from the 1999 direct-to-film musical starring none other than Donny Osmond in the role of Joseph. So let's take a look. Joseph's mother, she was quite my favorite wife. I never really loved another all my life. And Joseph was my joy because he reminded me of her. Through young Joseph, Jacob lived his youth again. Loved him, praised him, gave him all he could. But then it made the rest feel second best. And even if they were being told. To show the world he loved his son To make it clear That Joseph was the special one So Jacob bought his son a coat A multicolor coat to wear Joseph's coat was elegant The cup was fine The tasteful style was the ultimate thing And this is why it caught the eye A king would stop and But <laughs> I couldn't resist um, showing that just because it's so amazingly bizarre. But it does actually tell um, a good bit of the beginning of Joseph's story. And, you know, we saw there that there's definitely a bit of dysfunction in the family. And the brothers were not fans of Joseph, especially when he paraded around in his coat. And he also had dreams that he shared with them, scripture says, that seemed to indicate that one day they would all bow down to him. So as the story goes, the older brothers finally decided that they were sick of Joseph and decided to take an advantage of being rid of him once and for all. Maybe some of you have dreamt of this kind of opportunity for one of your siblings. They disagreed about how best to do this, but in the end, the opportunity arose for them to not only get rid of him, but to make some money off of it as well, they were thinking. They ran into some merchants who were coming through on their way to Egypt and decided to sell him off as a slave. Talk about revenge. Then they took Joseph's coat, covered it in goat's blood, and brought it back to their father to show that wild animals must have killed Joseph on his way to meet them, and it's so tragic and horrible. And of course, Jacob's heart was broken, but the brothers were not all that sad. So here is Joseph in an instant exchanging his title from favored son to despised brother and slave in a foreign land. I don't know who wouldn't lose hope at this point. His own family sold him as a slave. It seems like the natural response to all of this would be despair. Maybe some of you are in a place right now where you feel this way. Betrayed, rejected, abandoned, alone, and without hope. But if we continue to read Joseph's story, we quickly see that there's something within Joseph that enables him to not only survive the incredible challenges that he's faced with, but to thrive in a way that demonstrates to those around us, even around him, those that would even be considered his enemies, that the Lord was surely with him. 
After his brothers sell him to the merchants, it appears his good looks and build helped get him purchased as a slave in the home of the captain of the guard for Pharaoh, Potiphar. And what's the first thing we read about his time there? In Genesis 39.3, it says, Potiphar noticed that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. And what Potiphar's response to this is, is he makes Joseph his personal attendant and puts him in charge of his household and everything that he owned. Now, it would seem some consolation if the story ended here, but unfortunately, Potiphar's wife noticed how great Joseph was too and tried to get Joseph to sleep with her. I imagine the temptation was real, and yet Joseph refuses, telling her that it would actually be a sin against God to betray Potiphar in that way. Potiphar, the one who he was a slave to. Unfortunately, this was not the answer that she wanted, and so in her anger, she accuses Joseph of raping her, and so, or of trying to. And so Potiphar has no choice but to send Joseph into prison. Now, I would think that by this point, at least, Joseph would be ready to give up a life surrendered to God. It doesn't seem like it's working out for him very well. But this is what we read in Genesis 39, 21. But the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. So despite his circumstances, Joseph still experienced God being faithful in his love to him. Can you think of times in your own life where you were in the midst of struggle, but you still experienced God being present with you? There have been several times in my own life when a struggle has actually made me so desperate for God that I actually meet with God in a deeper way, a deeper way than I have before, because in my moments of weakness, I'm actually better able to receive God's love because nothing else is satisfying my needs and desires. I wonder if that's what God's love, how God's love met Joseph in that place, in the prison. But whatever it looked like, it was evident enough to those in prison that the prison warden actually decides to put Joseph in charge of the entire prison. And just as in Potiphar's home, everything succeeds under his leadership. And it seems that things are once again going on the upswing for Joseph, even though it seems kind of ridiculous. But one day, two of Pharaoh's officials get sent to prison with Joseph, and they each have a dream that Joseph is able to interpret. And he interprets them correctly, and the one who survives, he got the better message dream, um, ends up returning to Pharaoh, and he promises Joseph that he will tell Pharaoh about him and his gift. But two years go by, and Joseph is still in prison. Turns out the official forgot about his promise to Joseph. Until one day, Pharaoh is in need of someone to interpret his dream, and no one else seems to be able to do it. So the official remembers Joseph and brings Joseph to Pharaoh. You know, Joseph recognized that he had this gift, and that here was a perfect opportunity for Joseph to take all the credit but instead, he tells Pharaoh this. He says, it's beyond my power to do this, but God can tell you what it means and set you at ease. Joseph hadn't even listened to Pharaoh's dreams yet. His trust in God's faithfulness gave him confidence and authority that God would enable him to interpret these dreams. So he interprets the dreams as a warning of seven years of abundance in the land that would be followed by seven years of famine. And not only that, Joseph comes up with a plan that could help save the people of Egypt and the surrounding lands while also benefiting Pharaoh. He didn't have to do that. In Genesis 41, 38, Pharaoh responds with this. Can we find anyone else like this man, so obviously filled with the spirit of God? So what does he do? He puts him in second in command over all of Egypt. There seems to be a theme here, a response to what people are seeing in Joseph. And things would come full circle for Joseph as he eventually stands face to face with his brothers who have put him in this situation in the first place. Over 13 years, Joseph was forced to be a slave in a foreign land away from his beloved father, at the mercy of others who had power over him. And here he is 
in front of his brothers, his dreams of the past coming true, them bowing before him. His brothers didn't recognize him when they came begging to buy grain to feed their starving families. And if you read the story, it's clear that Joseph struggled with this desire to take justice into his own hands and to make revenge on those who had stolen his life from him. What would you do? Have you ever been tempted to take justice into your own hands, to seek revenge on those who have hurt you? Joseph was in a position of incredible power at this point, and he could have done anything to his brothers. But in Genesis 50, at the end of his story, Joseph says this to his brothers. He says, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. So he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. Joseph maintained his faithfulness to the Lord and his trust in God's faithfulness to him and his willingness to surrender to being a light in the darkness until the very end of his life. His brothers and their families would remain in Egypt and be taken care of as a result of his forgiveness and his mercy. Now, I recognize that Joseph's story is one of extremes in many ways, but I think that we all can relate to being in circumstances that seem beyond our control. Circumstances that could leave us wondering where God is in the midst of it. Through the characteristics that we see in Joseph, we can see how we are to live in these circumstances and be encouraged that it's because of God's many promises and what God has done for us and in us that we're not only able to live this way, but that it truly is the best blessed life we could choose. You know, scripture tells us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And what a amazing promise and hope that is for us that God meets us in the midst of our brokenness. So I just want to look briefly at three characteristics that Joseph possessed and then ask us to think about what that might look like in our own lives if we allow the Holy Spirit to transform our hearts and our minds to align with God's. The first is that I believe Joseph knew his identity as a beloved child of God. And so he could live a life of integrity that was fully surrendered to God's plan for his life. We see this in the way that people responded to him, how he gained their trust in the way it caused him to acknowledge God's presence in his life and place him in positions of authority. He was able to live a life that radiates God's presence even in the midst of his dark circumstances. So this morning, do you think of yourself as a beloved child of God? 1 John 3, 1 says, See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. Secondly, I think Jesus, or Joseph, also Jesus, had an eternal perspective that took the focus off of himself and his circumstances and placed it instead on seeing the Lord glorified in his life, trusting in God's greater plans and purposes. He chose to be a person of blessing and influence wherever he found himself, even when things didn't go as planned, or when it didn't last, or when he found himself accused, betrayed, and when promises were forgotten. He was able to acknowledge God's greater purpose for good, even if his brothers had intended him harm. Do you find it easy or difficult to surrender your present circumstances to God, trusting that God can bring good out of even the most terrible things? Despite how things may appear in the world, Jesus has promised that he has already won the ultimate victory over darkness. 1 John 4, 4 says, But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over these people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. And lastly, Joseph trusted God to bring about justice rather than seeking to bring about justice on his own. 
He didn't allow himself to give into the temptation to satisfy his own notions of justice, instead letting mercy and kindness direct his actions and trusting God to bring about the greatest good from his suffering. Micah 6, 8 tells us that this is what God desires. He says, O people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what God requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. We are living in a time when so many of us want to hold on to our own ideas of justice so tightly, but that's not what we're called to. The light that's in us is not justice enacted by us, but the light of what Christ has done for each one of us. As sinners and where we are then therefore called to be to others and to do to others. Jesus has called us to not only live for ourselves, but for others. To love even those who do wrong to us and to trust in God to be the judge. Jesus even goes so far to say in Matthew 5, 43 through 48, you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And that way you will be acting as true children of your father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and unjust alike. To me, this is a beautiful picture of God's unconditional love and grace. God's desire is that all would come to know God, and that should be our desire as well. What better way to draw people into the love of God than to demonstrate that love to each person we come in contact with? You know, when the Spirit of God lives in us, we become lights in the darkness, lights that demonstrate truth, hope, love, forgiveness, that demonstrate these things in the way that Jesus showed us and called us to follow him in. Sure, we're broken vessels that carry this light. Joseph was too. But in our brokenness, the light is actually able to shine more brightly in a world that desperately needs the hope that we bring. So if you find yourself in a place today where you feel like you've been living in dark places, be encouraged that God desires to shine in and through you. It's the Holy Spirit that strengthens you and enables you to live a life surrendered to Jesus. And Romans 8, 1 says this, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong in Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And I feel like God wants all of us today to hold on to this. He wants to fill us today with all that we need to live the life that God has called us to. The blessed life where we are rooted in, protected by, and productive for the Lord, like Jeff talked about last week. The life controlled by the Spirit of God living in you. So I want to invite you to do something with me. As you're able, would you stand so that we can come together? And I want us to, um, as we do that, the worship team can come back up. And um, I want to take an opportunity for us to invite God to do that very thing, to fill us with those things that we need to continue walking um, through even the challenges in our lives. And I have no doubt that many of us are struggling in different ways right now. And if you're not, I just want to say that's really great. And I want to bless that and say that maybe today God wants you to pray for and encourage someone else who is struggling but if you are in a place of struggle and you feel like you don't have what you need to continue surrendering to God where you're at right now, I just want to invite us to put our hands out and to invite God to give us that, to ask God that the Holy Spirit would impart in you a renewed sense of your identity in God. Sometimes I think it just helps to, to do something physically active and say, God, we are inviting your presence here. So God, we welcome you right now, God. We ask for more of your Holy Spirit that we might be able to live the life that you've called us to, a life surrendered to you, trusting that you know what is best for us. And God, in the places where we might be struggling right now, 
where maybe we don't feel like we have what it takes to live this out, God, would you help us to be lights? Would you give us what we need? Would you remind us of our identity in you, knowing that we can't do this on our own, that we need your help? And if anyone here this morning has never surrendered your life to God, if you've never accepted God's gift of unconditional love and forgiveness that he demonstrated through the death and resurrection of Jesus, now is a perfect time to do that. God wants to fill us. God wants to receive us and to bless our lives in ways that might look different than what we think. But a life lived with Christ is a transformed life, and no one and nothing can ever separate you from God's love. So God, I pray that we would receive that truth in us today. Amen. You know, in Galatians 6, 9, it says, let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. I think that's an encouragement to all of us this morning. And we're going to continue to have a time of worship here together. And I, I also want to invite those who are on the prayer team to come up. Um, we would love to have you come up and pray for people. And these people are trained to pray for you. They want to walk with you in this journey of faith. And so if there are things that God has brought up in your mind um, during this message and during this time of prayer that you'd like to have someone just agree with you or to pray over you, please come up or if there's any other needs that you might have this morning. Just invite you to come up and there'll be people up here to pray, pray for you. And usually we end um, our messages with a few tips to take with us as we leave this place. And so uh, something to read this week is to read the story of Joseph in Genesis 37 through 50. And also what I invite you to pray, to surrender your life to God and to the life of the Spirit and ask how you can be a light in the dark places around you. And finally, something to do. With God's help, show forgiveness and our compassion, kindness to someone who maybe you don't feel like deserves it this week. We forgive because Christ has forgiven us. And so I just, I just invite you to come and receive prayer and uh, just know that God is here this morning with us and wants to work in your life this morning. Thank you, God.
we do trust you. God, you're such a good God. And I wonder how Joseph felt when he was sold into slavery. And I wonder how Joseph felt when he rose to power in Potiphar's house, but yet was thrown into prison shortly after for being falsely accused. I wonder if he was able to trust you because God, sometimes I'm not able to trust you. But God, deep in my heart, I know that you're a good God, that you're a good father, full of kindness. And I know that you have a plan for my life. Let's sing that one more time. I trust you. 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 together friends do come forward and get prayer it's great to see that happening uh, this is one of these places where we can get what we need from the Lord so whatever need you have we welcome you to come forward for that say hi to Courtney on the way out if you have to head out and uh, blessings on you in Jesus name so good to be together let's say yes to the Lord and, and Lord would you would you be the one who is Lord of our day Lord of our week ahead until we gather together again.
love you, God. We love, we love. Oh, we love, we love. We love you. Yes, we love you. We love, we love. Oh, we love, we love. We love you. Yes, we love. 